Greetings. This is Artie from Artifact Electronics. Look at what I got in the mail. It's a Magnavox Odyssey 2 video game console from uh, 1975. It uh, came with all of this stuff you see. 12 cartridges, instruction manuals for both the uh, console and most of the games two permanently attached joystick controllers and uh, it has a uh, switch box a TV switch box here and the reason they, these were very common in the 70s also 80s because uh, you get an RF modulated output uh, containing the sound and video on this RCA plug and that usually goes to the uh, antenna terminals on your, on your television set and this made it easy because it had an RCA input for the game, it had uh, antenna inputs for your external antenna, and then you just plug the antenna terminals, screwed those to your television, and you could select between the game and TV shows. The console itself uh, is uh, pretty standard. You plug the cartridge in, turned on power, and after hitting the appropriate buttons played your game. Now this has one thing that most others didn't but it has the built-in keyboard. It's a membrane keyboard and uh, that has a little flex connector coming out that connects to the main PCB and uh, made the console somewhat bigger and unfortunately I don't even have any of the games like educational games or anything that make use of this uh, all I can use is usually the top row of numbers which you use to select uh, the game modes uh, you want to play. A little bit of history on this is uh, most people think that Atari was the one who pioneered home video games but that is not true. The, uh, the earlier, the predecessor to this which was called the Odyssey 1 is actually uh, the first mass-produced home video game which came out in 1972. Magnavox put it out. It was very very simplistic. Uh, it was basically geared towards Pong style games which of course were invented by Atari but it does, uh, uh, it does have the honor of being the first home video game and of course once uh, the Odyssey 1 came out everybody and their brother came out with a uh, uh, the game console and they were all promptly sued by Magnavox and Magnavox won. Well they won but I think most of the people especially Atari uh, settled with them. Uh, the terms were I don't know the terms were somewhat undisclosed but pretty much everybody admitted guilt that they had copied a lot of the principles employed in this uh, by Magnavox the uh, Magnavox itself, the two, sold about two million copies over its, li over its lifespan. Uh, just for comparison, the Atari 2600 sold more than 30 million units over its lifetime, and it was by far the most popular video game till about the mid mid 80s, when uh, Nintendo entered the market and uh, the rest is history. Let's have a look and see what it does. What I'm first going to do is, uh, I got it all hooked up to the TV and power, I'm going to turn it on without a cartridge inserted. And the reason I'm doing this will become apparent later on uh, because this is going to be a significant help towards the repair. But, let's hit the power switch and what we get on the screen is a collection of garbage which is static. So if you turn it on and off and this is this behavior is completely repeatable near the left middle of the screen you can see there's some animating pixels or flickering pixels I should say and uh, this is considered normal behavior when you turn the system on uh, without a cartridge inserted. And don't forget how old it is, but that's the way it worked. So now, 
Let me grab a cartridge and put that in and hit the power again. And we're getting the same behavior. And that's the reason why I showed it to you because it doesn't seem to matter whether there's a cartridge plugged in or not. It does not recognize the cartridge and even the uh, flickering is, is repeated right now. So uh, this is both good news and bad news. The, uh, the bad news is, is that the processor isn't running or is not executing code or is not finding code. The good news is, is that the video generating circuitry works because it is generating a clear display you know going through the RF connection and stuff which is usually really noisy but on this one it's actually pretty clean. So uh, in order to investigate this further let's go in and take this puppy apart. Here we have the PCB and I mean that's everything's pretty much contained on here the only other thing is uh, the uh, RF modulator which uh, because of FCC regulations is enclosed in, a, in an RF shield and the only other thing you may be able to see on here is that you were able to select channel 3 or channel 4 for your TV sorry channel 3 and 4 uh, but uh, you had to open the case to change this so uh, but channel 3 was normally what people had their uh, game channel on and uh, back to the main board of course uh, this is the edge connector that uh, the cartridge plugs into uh, we got a processor we got a custom chip uh, made uh, by Intel for for Magnavox that handled video and sound we have the uh, clock section that feeds both uh, the video display and the processor and the custom chip and then all of this is gated out to the RF modulator and the rest of it is glue logic and we also have the uh, connectors for the joystick controllers over here and this is where the flex connector from the keyboard plugged into it. To understand a little better what's going on let's have a look at the schematics. The processor is an Intel uh, 8048 which was the uh, predecessor to the 8031 series and it's an embedded processor over here. Uh, control lines on this side and especially 24 bits of I.O. here but it could be set up so that addresses and data were generated on these 24-bit uh, I.O. lines making it a more uh, more like other processors that could actually maintain a data bus and a, an address bus. This particular one though had a built-in mask ROM so if you could fit all your code on the mask ROM you then had uh, pretty much uh, 24 general purpose I.O. pins over here. But uh, the way this works is it has some helper functions in, uh, in ROM in the mask ROM but what it does is it accesses external ROM which in our case is the cartridge over here which is sitting on the address and data bus <clears throat> and that's why this thing comes up with garbage when there's nothing plugged in because even though the built-in ROM has rudimentary handlers for the startup vectors they all point into the uh, cartridge address space and if there is no cartridge <clears throat> then uh, not a whole lot happens. Now the data bus <clears throat> you can see it on the edge here let me turn this around the data bus is pulled up with resistors so if there's nothing plugged in the processor is going to keep a it'll start up jump into the uh, cartridge space and start reading FF's which I think are no ops on this processor so what it'll do is it'll increment the data bus step all the way through and then when it reaches the end of the address space it'll jump back to the beginning now it's going to start interpreting data that's sitting in the uh, mask ROM and uh, as we see it doesn't really do anything but uh, remember those flickering pixels I guess it is hitting some routines that are trying to alter the screen and it keeps doing this over and over again it just uh, steps through the whole address space and then starts over again at the beginning 
So the behavior we see, uh, or the defect, clearly indicates that there is something wrong with the connection between the processor and the cartridge port. Some lines may be bad. Uh, it's pretty much, it can be one of many things. But uh, now you have an idea of what goes on in here. And again, as we talked, here's the processor, here's the cartridge port, and uh, that's about it. So uh, I think we're going to have to go in and start measuring a bunch of things and see if that gives us a clue as to what's happening. I look at some of the waveforms of the scope, and uh, I actually got to a point where I was considering using the logic analyzer because I wasn't really getting anywhere, but uh, in the end I was too lazy and I just continued poking around. And uh, what I mentioned earlier is I could observe that the data bus, uh, I'm sorry, the address bus was essentially counting up uh, till it reached, till it fell off the end of the world, started over at the beginning again, then did some jumping around uh, when it was executing the ROM code here, not using proper entry points, of course, just sequentially jumping into it, and uh, eventually it would hit the uh, pulled up data bus, do a bunch of no-ops till it uh, fell off the end of the world and come back again. So. The, uh, what that told me was it was uh, nice because uh, the processor actually seemed to be running, but it wasn't being given any proper code, so it was just wildly jumping around. So the next step was uh, why isn't the cartridge getting selected? And what I did was uh, I probed uh, the edges of the edge connector here, of the contact, the uh, of the contacts here. And uh, looking at the schematic, there should be activity on all of them. And I noticed there were three pins that had no activity on them. So I turned it off, and I just did a continuity check, and I found three uh, contacts in here that weren't connected to where they were supposed to be connected. Actually, they weren't connected to anything at all. Aha! Uh -huh. I said, that's very interesting. Uh, let's uh, investigate this a little bit further. And uh, long story short was that essentially the pins that were disconnected uh, had traces, they were connected to traces on the board, but part of those traces were underneath the actual connector. And it seemed that the disconnect in the trace was happening underneath the connector. Now, uh, this is a, a high stress part. Uh, you push the cartridge in and pull it out all the time. And what my guess was is that it may have damaged the uh, traces that weren't connected underneath on the PC board, and uh, thus there was no continuity. So uh, the idea was let's go ahead and connect those and uh, see if, uh, if all of them are securely connected, what happens next. Here's the underside, and you can see... I just jumpered uh, the uh, non not connected pins using wire wrap wire to the uh, through holes here. Now also notice these, uh, I call them through holes, they are not vias because they're not plated through. So another source of a problem on a board like this could be if these uh, through holes aren't properly, if they're not used, if there's nothing inserted in them, they need to be filled properly with solder to connect the top and bottom of the board, and if they're not, it will cause a problem. But these were already properly filled, and uh, when I inserted the wire, I made sure that the wire protruded on the other side, and uh, thus made a connection between top and bottom of the board. Uh, as an interesting aside is there's this capacitor put on after the fact, and the reason for that is when you look at the schematic, the bypass capacitor for the processor is a 0.01 microfarad. And that's not enough. It needs a 0.1. So what they did is they uh, just retrofitted it with a 0.1 on the back of the board, but they left the 0.01 uh, on the other side. Now, you know, since they're in parallel, that doesn't really make a difference. But uh, I guess they found out the hard way that uh, without a proper bypass capacitor, the uh, processor would act funny. But, what am I babbling about? You want to know what these fixes did. Well, again, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that when I plucked the cartridge in and I hooked it up, the cartridge came up. 
And the way that works is it basically says select game, that's what they all do, and then you press a number between 0 and 9, and uh, that puts it into the proper game or game mode that you want. And that worked, but when I did that and then I started uh, using the controllers to actually play a game, things just, things just wouldn't work. It, uh, it took me a while. I, it, it behaved, uh, everything behaved really, really strangely. And finally I figured out that what was happening was, A, some of the uh, signals coming in were permanently on. So I was seeing like a left or a right or, or a button press permanently. And the second thing was that it seemed that some of the data lines were shorted to each other. Now the way these work is they are digital joysticks. They return five bits of data, one for each of the primary directions and one for the button. And normally they're open and uh, when you do something on the joystick it just closes the, uh, it shorts the control line in question to ground and that's the way it, uh, the processor knows if anything's been pressed. And on this one it just, after a lot of back and forth, Fourth, I, I started measuring a few things, and it looked like some of the uh, some of the switches were not only stuck, but they were shorted to another switch. So what would happen is, let's say, if you pressed right, it would also push the button for you. So as you can imagine, uh, things were acting very strangely. This brought back memories from long ago, and that is uh, when I had once worked on a. Uh, on a Nintendo 8-bit game, and we had to submit those to Nintendo, of course, for approval. And uh, the game got done, as usual, there was very little time, and uh, the game got submitted. And uh, we're sitting there on pins and needles waiting for it to pass, and uh, a few days later Nintendo kicks the game and says, yeah, there's something bad in there. So uh, I read the documents they sent, and their complaint was that if you press all four directions at once, uh, the game hangs up. So on the Nintendo it looks differently, but the, the mechanism is such that you can't press up or down at the same time, as well as not left or right, much less all four directions at once. So I thought, ha, huh, I got you guys. Of course, I get on the horn, I talk to them and everything, and I said, look guys, it's impossible, you can't press all four directions at once. And their uh, immediate response was, yes, you can, if part of the joystick is broken. So uh, that shut me up real good, but uh, I looked at the Nintendo joysticks, and yes, there's a plastic piece that, theoretically, if that cracks, and you press on top of the controller, all four directions close at once. It was a minor defect in the code that I had never even thought of and was fixed very quickly, but uh, always expect the unexpected. I need to mention that before doing any of the probing and continuity checks, first thing you really should do is, of course, reflow all of the connections here. I did that before doing any more work and it made no difference. So there were no cracked solder joints here and uh, but that is usually a good thing to do beforehand. Also the second thing is, if you're at all familiar with cartridges, is they're basically an edge connector. Of course now I can't show it. I mean it's the edge of the PC board and there's the contact fingers on it. One thing you need to do is uh, those get dirty and corroded and won't, will not make proper contact with the edge connector. So what you do is you stick a, a Q-tip that is uh, with IPA on it in there and rub it back and forth to get any sort of corrosion out of the uh, or off of these connectors and that is something that I did to all of the cartridges that I had and I got a lot of dirt off of them but it made no difference uh, it, they, they still wouldn't make contact the same problem can also exist in the uh, edge connector itself uh, all the corrosion, it either corrodes itself or the corrosion and dirt get passed from the cartridges. And the way to fix that is take a business card, fold it in half, and uh, moisten the edge with IPA and then just stick it in a couple of times. And uh, on this one I saw a lot of dirt and rust-like spots come out of here. But I did that and then I observed it and it looked clean. So everything was clean at this point but uh, the cartridge still didn't run.
One thing I didn't notice till a little bit later was that on all of these video games, notice how the RF modulator is enclosed in an RF shield, which was an FCC requirement so you wouldn't affect TV reception. The same went for the uh, PC boards. They had to be enclosed with a shield, both top and bottom. And pretty much everything I've seen had the, those shields, and you can still kind of see the crimp points at the end here, some solder where the shield may have been soldered in, but the whole thing originally was enclosed both top and bottom with a shield. That shield is gone. So uh, somebody's been in here, and of course you got to remove the shield to see anything of what's happening on the board. So the shield got removed, somebody looked in here, and then put it all back together again, neglecting to put the shields back into place. So, the point is, somebody tried to repair this and uh, didn't get anywhere. But back to the joystick problem. So this is where they're connected. And uh, so basically there's a ground line going out and then there's five data lines coming back. And remember early on, we looked at it and we saw that the data bus had pull-ups on it. Well, when it reads the joysticks, it basically gates these data bits onto the data bus. And uh, when there's nothing pressed on the controllers, because of the pull-ups, it returns a logic high. Now, if any of the uh, joystick uh, directions or button are pressed, that, uh, that particular data bit comes back as low. And since those are active low, that's how it tells the processor that something got pressed. Now what I did was I turned it on and I measured the incoming data lines with uh, the joysticks at rest. And uh, it looked like some of them were permanently pulled low. And I did some tests and I actually found what I said before that if I took one of them and uh, selected the right direction the right direction went low as well as the button. So yeah, something was messed up and in order to isolate where the problem existed, I just disconnected the joysticks and when I measured them on the board, uh, all the data lines were high, just as expected. So the problem lies inside both of the joysticks which are shorting some lines. And in order to investigate that, we're going to have to take the joystick apart. To get inside the joystick, uh, we remove the two screws from the bottom, and uh, that will allow us to lift off the top. We then see the flex PCB in here. It's multi-layered with little contact uh, springs, actually flat parts of metal in there that act as the contacts that uh, when you press a joystick connect the top layer to the bottom layer and short the appropriate line to ground. We take off the external connector and now we need to get, in order to get this out, we need to get both this uh, knob off to get this whole assembly out and uh, the way I figured out to do that is we uh, clamp the joystick itself, put a little bit of padding around the knob so as not to scratch it, and it's held in place by friction, so we just work it off. Easier said than done. There we go. Now there's one more obstacle, as you can see, there's a speed nut in a notch here holding that whole assembly down, but we can uh, get that one out with a pair of pliers by uh, working it back and forth a little bit until some of the pins in the center of the speed nut bend upwards, and then we have access to everything that disassembles. And here's the board. Now what I found when I originally opened this is there were areas of rust overlaying right over here. And uh, 
rust never sleeps and it's not conductive as is but uh, if the metal hasn't fully oxidized here or there is some moisture in the air it does become conductive and at that point it will start shorting things in unpredictable ways and that's probably what was happening here so what I did was this is all glued on like the, I mean with adhesive but I pulled the affected area off carefully and then stuck a q-tip underneath here where the rust was with IPA and was able to clean off all of the rust I then did some uh, continuity checks on everything and uh, at this point nothing was shorted against anything else and then I actually tested by pressing the different directions and the button and they would close so I think that's what fixed the problem so now we'll just go back and put it all back together again and of course uh, we would need to apply the same treatment to the other joystick which has its own set of problems but uh, it did take me a little bit of while to figure out how to take this thing apart non-destructively uh, the, the speed nut had me going now the problem of course with the speed nut is is that once you remove it it no longer acts as a speed nut but rather a washer it's not very tight but fortunately we don't have to go to the hardware store can fix a speed nut by basically crimping it back together by flattening it out again and at that point all the teeth are ready to grip whatever you're slipping it into and you just slide it down until it clicks into the notch on the bottom of the shaft here uh, you then take uh, the knob itself and just press it back into place and make sure that it's in place so it doesn't fall off you take the connector and plug it back into the uh, into the flex PCB connector and make sure that the black wire points towards the uh, middle of the joystick and once you do all of that you put it back together put the screws back in and then see if you fix the problem in order to test this properly I pretty much had to reassemble the whole thing this is where the flex connector from the keyboards coming in it's underneath here it's this big void here uh, but uh, I was afraid that if I had the boards laying loosely around and plugged it in and I jarred the boards or something I'd tear this and that would be game over you do need the keyboard to start the games so uh, so it's pretty much it's pretty much put together so uh, let's plug it into the uh, well let's put the bottom on plug it into the TV and see what happens now as I was looking around through my collection to see if I had any other cartridges I actually came across another Odyssey cartridge that I already had in my collection it's this one and you can see this is a custom cartridge it's got that alien curvature on the uh, handle for comparison's sake this is what a normal one looks like so uh, this one looks like uh, it got too close to the sun so even though this is alien invaders plus I shall call it uh, Icarus from now on and now for the exciting part let's test this our first test cartridge will be Icarus also known as alien invaders plus Fortunately, the cartridge was not deformed on the lower half, so it fit into the uh, Odyssey. And here we go. Select game. Game is selected. So, uh, yeah, that sure looks like Space Invaders to me. What you are witnessing is... Uh, a glorious resolution of 160 by 200 pixels actually that's probably 200 by 160 4-bit color depth and for sound it uses a single 24-bit shift register uh, it's clockable at two frequencies and it has a noise generator and uh, Where's the joystick? Here is the joystick. Oh. 
So it looks like those little green balls can't be destroyed. They act as blockers. And when I get hit, I turn to the little man. And then if I hit the button, I turn back into the cannon. And then he gets angry at me, and the Cyclops comes and attacks me. And I'm really not too sure what I'm supposed to do at that point, because I can't get out of it. But uh, it works, and uh, here's... The f here was the first demo. Now, the second demo is, uh, it's called the Blockout Breakout, no, Breakdown, so that gives us a hint what it's going to be. And mercifully, this one goes into demo mode by itself, so I don't even have to do anything. And uh, in this mode, yeah, it's Breakout, it's bouncing off the blocks and making them disappear and there's these little men running around and uh, now it switches into a different mode where basically it passes through the blocks and the little men fall to their deaths and uh, kind of look mummified when they fall down and um, I could probably read the manuals and figure out what this means but I'm not gonna bother the quality is actually pretty good. As I mentioned before, usually these kinds of connections exhibit a lot of noise and distortion and all sorts of things. And yes, I know this is a digital display, but uh, they still look pretty bad. But the colors are solid and the edges are pretty well defined. So that looks good. Next, we will have a look at Casey Munchkin. AC Munchkin is a very strange version of Pac-Man, I guess. So what happens if I eat the dots? Oh, they turn purple and I can pass through them. Oh, they turn back and they ate me. I guess the biggest difference is that the, the pills the pills actually move around rather than being stationary. And when you eat that purple pill, they turn purple. Well, not all of them, I guess. Hmm. And uh, there you have it, another original game. I'm going to have to keep trying here. I hope to find something a little bit more original. This one is called Cosmic Conflict. Press 1, it says. Oh, this joystick. All right, we are looking at Atari Star Raiders here. So what do I do? I follow this guy. Oh, I can shoot. The X-Wing wants to kill me. Yeah, this is a really good demo. Come back. So what you're supposed to do is get the ship in the crosshairs, I guess, and hey, and shoot them when they're right in the middle. And yeah, I know this is not a great demo. Oh, come on, I gotta get one at least. I got one. Oh, uh, I really don't know what else to pick here because there's nothing really new, but we will do one last one and hope that this one is original. It's called Pickaxe Pete. And this one does... Oh. Our stick. Oh, and he can jump. Yeah, this is basically Miner 2049er from the Atari computers. I think you're supposed to get to the top of the screen. Oops, I lost my pickaxe. Okay. And what, what do I do now?
I don't oh it says I think there was an arrow pointing down hmm anyway so uh, I won't continue because uh, pretty much the rest of it will probably look like this so now we can finally finish up and there you have it <clears throat> another vintage item fixed so now I have a Magnavox Odyssey 2 in my collection that works very nicely and maybe one day I'll actually sit down and uh, read through the uh, leaflets and figure out how those games are supposed to be played and play them. I'm actually uh, becoming a little bit uh, curious about the Pickaxe Pete game but of course in the beginning I said there are manuals for some of the games there's no manual for Pickaxe Pete so I'll look that up online and uh, see if I can master it. So I hope that uh, you learned something and uh, if you have a, or you come in possession of an Odyssey 2 or you got one sitting in the attic that isn't working anymore that this will serve as a guide for you to get it running again and save yours from the landfill. If you have any kids make sure to show them these games so they know how good they have it nowadays as far as uh, console games are concerned. So, uh, if you think this deserves a thumbs up, don't be shy about giving me one. And also make sure, if you haven't already subscribed, to subscribe so you won't miss any future episodes. See you at the next one.